The title of my seminar is The Investigation of Genetic and Phenotypic Diversity to Develop Multiple Virus Resistant Snappings. And like Griff said, I think um, my title illustrates my goal to work on, on, a, on a problem that was local and in which um, with some effort that I could potentially have some impact in. Uh, a brief outline of the presentation. I'm just gonna briefly introduce the genetic diversity of Phaseolus vulgaris, the common bean. I'll talk about the importance of snap beans in New York State and the Great Lakes region in general. I'll then talk about uh, a new and emerging issue in snap bean production in these regions, and that's an aphid transmitted virus disease complex, which is the focus of my research. I'll then talk about uh, my research objectives and crop improvement goals and, and the progress that I made towards those objectives. I'll then uh, finish by summarizing what I did and talk, have a little discussion about future research. So Phaseolus vulgaris, the common bean, is an in incredibly important source of, of nutrients, uh, pro protein, complex carbohydrates, iron and zinc for a lot of people all over the world, but especially smallholder farmers in places like Latin America and East Africa. And it's really the diversity of Phaseolus vulgaris that has allowed it to <coughs> adapt to so many different types of agroecological production systems from the humid tropics to upland sort of dry to North America. And this diversity originates um, the wild progenitor of Phaseolus vulgaris uh, can be found really from northern Mexico to sort of Mid, mid to northern Chile. And the domestication of this wild progenitor took place directly at least two different times, once in southern Mexico and once in the Andean region in Peru about five to 8,000 years ago. And there's <coughs> potentially an ancestral population of the entire um, wild progenitor in uh, Venezuela and Colombia. And this diversity, uh, these domestication events in both of these places led to early agriculturalists to further select and diversify uh, this genetic diversity into these different seed types that, that, we all, that we all see and appreciate for their eating quality. And also these different plant types that have different uh, characteristics in terms of phenology and complementation with, with other crops. And snap beans in particular are thought to come from the Andean domestication center. There's not a lot of evidence uh, for this, but it, um, the limited amount that's there suggests this. More recent evidence with um, more molecular markers and additional research has, has led to the idea that perhaps snap bean has a lot more introgression between these two gene pools. And this is important, I think, it's, I think it could represent a source of novel and important allelic variation to improve all of common bean. But certainly snap bean on its own has diverged from these dry bean types. And you can see that in this little image here where the seed type of, of snap beans has really taken on this cylinder type of shape. And this probably reflects the selection for the, the, the fleshy pod uh, characteristic and the reduced fiber. And a lot of that selection took place after the Columbian exchange, although some, uh, obviously, probably some dual purpose, fresh, dry selection was going on in the Americas before the Columbian exchange. And that leaves us today with all of these different market classes of, com of dry bean and different market classes of snap bean that really, in order to improve them, require uh, separate breeding programs. And as the diversity of, of common bean is a strength, this is also a really big challenge um, to improve all of these different seed types because of the different growth habits, because of the different consumer preferences, et cetera. And, and I really think that uh, emerging genomics technologies can really advance and accelerate common bean breeding to where, where it needs to be. <coughs> um, it's, it's a true diploid. Uh, it has very, very uh, relatively low levels of, of uh, sequence duplication. It has a relatively small genome at 520 megabases. So it's, it really could be a model legume for um, genomics, 
and structure and, and function of, of, uh, of the genome, especially in terms of, of soybean and other crops. And, and as such, its genome was sequenced just recently. The first version has been made available. It's on Phytosome. And the first real genomics resource that the bean community has had has been a, a 6K SNP chip, <coughs> which is based on um, SNPs that were discovered mostly in dry bean. And in, in, in practical use, it, it, there is certainly a lot of ascertainment bias and problems applying it to, to these different market classes. I would be remiss uh, talking about snap beans in New York if I didn't mention this man. And this is Calvin Keeney. He's from Leroy, New York. <coughs> and he is the man that took the string out of string beans. <coughs> and I can't imagine snap beans with a lot of fiber in them. I don't think they would be nearly as widely consumed. And we're not 100% sure, but we think that maybe you know, his identification of a very low suture uh, string fiber has then made its way into all modern snap beans. And that's something I, I'd like to test in the future. But this is Burpee's stringless green pod, and, and this surely plays a role in the, in the, in the uh, pedigree of, of most modern bean cultivars. <coughs> uh, his family has been a, a generous source of funds to this department, and uh, Dr. Michael Mazurik is the Calvin Keeney Endowed Professor of Vegetable Breeding. And um, Leroy is, is also still to this day a very important place for snap bean production. And it's also where Jell-O was invented. So <laughs> if you're looking for inspiration in terms of you know, inventing something, maybe you should go to Leroy, New York. <laughs> so as I say, uh, snap bean is, is really important in New York and the Great Lakes region. It's, a, it's about a $50 million farm gate value here in New York where we grow approximately um, 25,000 acres. This is uh, west of, of Rochester mostly. And then also in the Central Sands region of Wisconsin, in some areas in, in uh, Illinois, a uh, few, uh, few places in Michigan and Pennsylvania, add up to a total of about 150,000 acres in this Great Lakes region every year. And I've just put like the five, uh, the five most recent years, the acreage and the farm gate value of the crop and here you can see in, in 2009, you have approximately average acreage or, or even high in this case for New York. And you've got a much lower dollar value um, than, than, than other years. And likely this was due uh, to, the, to an aphid transmitted virus disease complex. And the appearance of this has coincided with the introduction of the Asian soybean aphid to the United States in, in about 2000. This was an accidental introduction and since then, it's become a very economically important pest of soybean and a very important vector of viruses in snap bean. Um, it overwinters in field margins and in forests on the, on the buckthorn. And it has a very interesting population dynamic where uh, large populations are seen in an every other year cycle, at least at the, at least at the first decade that it appeared in North America. And the losses in snap beans in New York State, these are very rough estimates that were provided by a processor, um, <clears throat> are, are amounting every year. And total, it's, it's in the tens of millions. And <clears throat> it, it seemed to not appear very, very often from 2010 onward. This could be due to um, natural control <coughs> or natural enemies controlling and things like that. But then in 2013, um, maybe not so much in New York, but definitely in Wisconsin, it seemed uh, aphid-transmitted viruses were back and, and, and very damaging. And so it really is a complex where these are really a list of the viruses that you could find since 2000 in a, in a, bean, in a snap bean field. And the ones that are, have color and, and are highlighted are, are really the ones that are the most prevalent and also probably the most damaging to the crop in terms, in terms of yield and quality. And these are the ones that Griff's program has decided to focus on and, and the ones that I decided to focus my research on. And this is just an example of some of the symptoms of clover yellow vein virus. This is a, a single-stranded podivirus. Um, you get a lot of extreme stunting 
and reduced yield oh, here, over here. I'm going to talk about some of my field work, and, and these are the results of the field work. You can really see the, res, uh, the results when, when plants are infected early. This would be a naturally infected plant in the field that is just completely stunted and, and likely won't, won't produce any yield. Bean yellow mosaic virus is, is closely related to clover yellow vein virus. It's also a single-stranded RNA <coughs> potivirus. <coughs> it does, has similar uh, symptoms, although it may not be as severe. And in the field, um, this is infected on, <coughs> on your left and, and healthy on the right. And it can be somewhat nondescript, although you, it will definitely reduce the pod yield and the pod size. And cucumber mosaic virus is really the one that's most noticeable because of this irrumpent blistering, which I think looks really cool. Um, it also <coughs> stunts the plant. Um, I think a lot of this is due to accumulation of cucumber mosaic virus, and it's a complex phenotype in that plants can often grow out of these, out of these symptoms after infection. And so you can wind up with a leaf, with uh, leaves coming off a plant that look relatively normal, um, but you can have a plant that's not really set any pods. And so that's really due to a, a, um, both accumulation of the virus and then movement throughout the plant to the point where you're having flowers that are becoming deformed and those flowers are failing to set. And so you get pods that are about the same size, but you just don't get as many of them. And this is just an image of a, of a deformed flower, um, the, the Cornell um, Core Labs Imaging Center has a micro CT, and maybe they'll hate me for telling you, but the first time is free. And so I took some of my deformed flowers and uh, used the micro CT scanner. And, and this, and unfortunately I don't have a healthy uh, flower to show you, but basically the, the anthers and the, and the style are wrapped inside this center structure of the flower called the keel. And, and it normally forms in a spiral, fu uh, spiral pattern and the anthers and, and stigma eventually come into close physical contact for, for pollination and fertilization. And basically this giant crook right here in the center, it looks to me like it's, it's creating a physical barrier um, where the pollen, the, uh, sorry, the anther, anthers cannot get to the, to the top of the flower where the stigma is. And so this, this flower likely wouldn't have set a pod. And this is an image of, um, I was in Wisconsin this summer. This is about a two to 300 acre uh, processing snap bean field in the central sands area. Unfortunately, the way the wind was blowing uh, and, and maybe the distance you can't really see, but it seemed like the majority of the plants in this field were infected with cucumber mosaic virus. <coughs> and it also seems that there's a fair amount of variation in the, in the types of strains and symptoms that, that cucumber mosaic virus strains can cause. We can have a strain like I, I described earlier where a plant can, can um, recover from infection but still maybe not set pods. But a, a lot of what we saw in Wisconsin was, were plants that had these blister symptoms on every leaf of the plant and a lot of deformed flowers. Uh, I would love to know how this field actually yielded. I, I, don't, I don't have that information. And then again, you can see the, um, plants that have been naturally infected by clover yellow vein virus and bean yellow mosaic virus in the field with this severe stunting, some ne necrosis here, and just the lack of yield that they would have compared to um, healthy controls in the background. So, oops. So the way that these epidemics happen in fields like this is that the aphid vectors, as in the, whoops, as in the soybean aphid, and a number of other vectors that are capable of transmitting these viruses, they're all transmitted in a non-persistent manner, meaning that the, the vector can acquire and transmit these viruses very quickly. And because they don't complete their life cycle on snapping, they basically either wind up in snapping from soybeans or from alfalfa, potentially due to uh, building populations. You, you get more and more winged aphids that then leave the, their host plant looking for an, a new host. And also because of alfalfa, we're cutting it three or four times during the summer, and that could also be a potential source of, wing, of winged aphids, <coughs> as well as weather patterns throughout the country. And so what's happening is these aphids that aren't 
necessarily, they're not looking to live on these beans, they're just moving through the field and as they go they're probing and going on to the next plant probing and transmitting the virus. And this is how it becomes uh, an, 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 an epidemic in proportion. And really there's no way to control this, there's no way to predict it, and there's no way to control it with pesticides because by the time you get the tractor out there and the pesticides on, you've, you've got a lot of uh, transmission already and you can always have more aphids coming in immediately afterwards. So um, really resistance, host plant resistance or, or tolerance to yield loss in these viruses is, is the only practical solution. And so <coughs> that's uh, what I formed my research research objectives around and the first objective that I had was really uh, to identify and evaluate the phenotypic variation available in snap beans for resistance and or tolerance to these three viruses. Uh, the second objective was then to elucidate the molecular genetics of resistance to some of these viruses. I couldn't get to all of them and subse subsequently enable <coughs> uh, marker assisted gene pyramiding for to develop multiple virus resistant snap beans. So we started out um, screening snap beans in the greenhouse and you can do this on a seedling scale in these 18 cell flats, it's very efficient. We can put about 4,000 plants in a house <coughs> and you can inoculate them as soon as they emerge and about 10 days later you can look at the first trifoliate leaf to see what kind of symptoms they're expressing and that, that's what I'm showing here. Um, I should mention I've started by screening about 150 snap bean cultivars. Um, these were part of uh, the bean coordinated agricultural project, the very small snap bean component of that project. I added uh, and sort of found and assembled an additional 230 to make a nice panel of 380 snap beans that are, include <coughs> um, burpee stringless green pod all the way to, to modern cultivars as long as they don't have um, intellectual property claims on them. Many of these are XPVP and so there's information that comes with them. And so screening, <coughs> screening these uh, snap bean lines the way that I described, we really saw patterns of distinct symptom expression. And so for CMV this blistering is very common but also actually even more common is a very uh, nondescript sort of set of symptoms. Maybe just a little bit of vein clearing and that would, these would be in, in comparison to this resistant control. Um, there were about 25 severe responses out of the 380 that actually had this severe blistering response. Um, as serendipity would have it, these are the 25 cultivars that were leading the processing industry before uh, the, these viruses really emerged. And so <coughs> this, cultivar high style was subse subsequently replaced with something like this Huntington which has higher yield potential in, in general but also uh, may have some tolerance to yield loss caused by the viruses. Uh, with bean yellow mosaic virus you have the same sort of, uh, <coughs> same sort of s severity of symptoms where you can have very severe symptoms and arrested development almost. You can have uh, um, and that we had uh, about 334 of the 380 that had very severe symptoms and then about 46 of them that develop somewhat normally but just have a, a, a pronounced mosaic and those would be in comparison to this resistant control. In clover yellow vein virus uh, there's really it, you either have resistance or susceptibility and susceptibility is severe. Uh, there's necrosis involved in very stunted plants and we were lucky enough to identify 18 resistant uh, snapping cultivars, which, which was interesting um, in that panel. And so then the question became, well, do these patterns of symptom expression mean anything in terms of yield in the field? And so I wanted to design uh, some field experiments to answer that question. And to also answer just in general, what is the impact on, on, on snap bean yield that these uh, viruses cause um, and look at the correlation between symptom severity in the greenhouse and yield in the field and, and in order to do this I needed to develop some efficient um, methodology to do this in the field which was way more difficult than I ever bargained for. <coughs> and then this, these set of images just represent um, 
sort of what I went through to get the, to, to eventually get to this point of having, having good methodology to do this. And I started out with this, le with this mist sprayer or mist blower <coughs> and uh, about 40 cultivars. And I had a set of inoculated uh, lines and a set of uninoculated lines. And it was really inefficient in that you needed gallons and gallons of inoculum. And after, after testing a lot or doing a lot of sampling, I found that my inoculation efficiency was really low, about 50%. And then I also sampled the uninoculated plants and realized that they were, had become infected um, at about a 50% level because I didn't exclude aphids from, from the plots. And so that was really like a preliminary trial. So then I moved into um, <clears throat> using the same inoculation system, but just thought I could do it twice as hard or twice as much and, and, get, and do twice as, twice as good. And well, unfortunately, that, that didn't work either. But at least when I did my sampling in this uh, second year of, of studies, I, I used this insect exclosure and was able to keep um, aphids out of, out of the experimental plots and keep healthy plants healthy. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when you do that, uh, you can't get in there to weed, and if you don't have good weed control, you get uh, this is this field with the row covers removed later in the season, and it was just it was a real mess of weeds and, and, and an enormous challenge <coughs> um, to, to really even look at the plots. And <coughs> at that point, I, I, I decided to let the plants dry down just to see if um, perhaps the virus was just influencing the maturity levels, as in if you harvest fresh and you harvest uninoculated and inoculated at the same time, are you just capturing a maturity difference? And so in order to sort of avoid that, I, th I thought I would let the plants go to physiological maturity. Well, this isn't drying down, this is more like rotting down. And I, I mean, I knew this, I should have known better. I mean, this is upstate New York, of, of course, it started raining early. And so we wound up harvesting a bunch of uh, really dead, dried, moldy um, data, which uh, after looking at a bit of the data, <coughs> it just really wasn't worth continuing with. So back to, back to doing it again. And, and I, I really needed a, a, a more efficient way to screen. I wanted to look at, at more genotypes. And so um, this class of designs called augmented designs was something that I had been aware of and started reading about. Um, so I used an augmented split plot design where I had a couple check genotypes and then most of the uh, two check genotypes and then 16 genotypes that were unreplicated. Some of you that know a bit about augmented designs may, may see a, a problem with this too, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> 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 In any case, um, I, I, I think um, I'm really proud of this image because I really got the experiment, the sort of the experiment to work and, um, and managed to have weed control and everything. And I, I just think this picture looks beautiful, but the, the resident coyote just didn't want to let me have that. So he ran through there. And um, anyways, it wasn't that big of a deal. And, and the data was, was okay. But what I wound up doing uh, was getting rid of the, the backpack sprayer and moving to an airbrush system. And I wanted to find a way to not have to be on my hands and knees with the airbrush. So this was an airbrush, um, a portable compressor, and a car battery in a, uh, in a tote that I lugged around the field. And I wanted to find a way to not have to bend down and inoculate 7,000 plants. Um, so I used, had this idea for a nifty grabber that you might use if you, were, you, know, if you couldn't reach very, very high. But that didn't quite work either. And so probably the reason why there's no pictures of me doing the inoculation of these fields is because my coworkers just probably thought I looked really angry and annoyed most of that <laughs> summer. Um, but you can tell my, the infection efficiency was, was much better where out of the 80, uh, 480 plants I sampled, I had an 85% in, uh, infection efficiency. And, and then I also sampled all 480 plants from my uninoculated controls and only had about 1% that somehow became infected. And so that was, that was pretty good. <clears throat> and so just, just broadly across the 18 genotypes that were entered in these, in these experiments, um, I was able to, to look and, and to get pretty good estimates of what, what kind of yield reduction you could res expect. Now, these plants were inoculated at a seedling stage. And so th this may not be completely representative of, of, um, of what's happening in the, in the field, but 
there is no other data. So <coughs> you can see that CMV had, uh, had approximately a 30.5% per, 30 reduction of the to I harvested these pods fresh. So there was a 30% reduction in fresh weight and not so much in terms of pod weight, which means a lot of these pods would have been, this would have been marketable yield. And across the 18 genotypes, there was a range of reduction from three, only 3% 3 loss to 77% loss. And <coughs> as you look at bean yellow mosaic virus and clover yellow vein virus, they're, they're much more severe, as I showed you in the pictures earlier. And the fresh weight losses were much higher, as well as the, as well as the pod weight losses were much higher. But for bean yellow mosaic virus, again, there was a really wide range of yield loss from 5 to 88%. <coughs> And with clover yellow vein virus, there, there, really, wasn't, there really wasn't anything. <coughs> so were the uh, symptoms that we observed in the greenhouse, <coughs> could you were they well correlated with, with what we saw in the field? And for cucumber mosaic virus, the, the correlation coefficient was, was really low. And <coughs> I think that's because the, the blistering response in the first trifolia leaf doesn't capture what happens afterwards. And, and that is that you could have that, that it's uncoupled from things like recovery or virus accumulation and movement in the rest of the plant. <clears throat> For bean yellow mosaic virus, um, the correlation was a lot better. And um, basically, we, we would want to avoid planting the severe responses that you would see in the greenhouse or recommend them as, as cultivars with, they did not have any real tolerance. It was only the ones that did not have uh, severe symptoms in the greenhouse that had some degree of tolerance. So we'd like to do better than tolerance, though we'd like to <clears throat> minimize or, or you know, reduce the damage to, to that producers, um, that they get to um, <clears throat> as much as possible. And, and as I mentioned, the only way to do that would be through host resistance. These are the 11 chromosomes of, of common bean with um, just the positions of, of the virus major virus resistance genes there are about six of them that have been mapped. There are about um, 20 viruses that infect common bean. And there's a couple QTLs that have been mapped for, for virus resistance as well. Um, viruses are a problem everywhere that beans are grown, but perhaps because of the sporadic nature, um, there hasn't been a lot of research into them. And then, of course, we wanted to enable, um, develop an efficient way to select for these major resistance genes in the breeding program because we had these sort of really diverse donors of these genes. Um, there were multiple genes. There are some interaction, epistatic interactions between some of these virus resistance genes. We have problems with linkage drag. And then, of course, um, thinking about durability, we need markers to pyramid uh, some of the alleles. So we needed to define sort of our, our target genotype for multiple virus resistance for North America. For clover yellow vein virus, a number of single recessive genes had been reported and one major dominant gene. Um, and same with bean yellow mosaic virus, this one uh, major dominant gene, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. And for cucumber mosaic virus, there's really this, this non-blistering response, which is an incompletely dominant gene. <coughs> Um, that, that conditions the as absence of, of the blistering response. And then resistance is really found in Phaseolus coccinius, the runner bean, um, and is, is being worked on at present. So we, I wanted to figure out the locations and the linkage of these genes and, oops, and be able to efficiently identify them in the breeding program. So for clover yellow vein virus, most of this work uh, was done at the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station where I work by Dr. Mike Dixon, who is the predecessor of, of my advisor, Dr. Griffiths, and by Rosie Providenti. And both of these uh, gentlemen played really important roles in, 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 my, in, in what I knew going forward with my project. So clover yellow vein virus, it, it used to be referred to as the severe or necro necrosis inducing strain of bean yellow mosaic virus, which is why it has a BY3 gene symbol. It was subse subsequently revised to its own uh, species and the gene symbol was changed. There were some allele allelism studies um, identifying additional cultivars where this gene was present. There was a near isogenic line, a black bean um, developed here at Cornell, known as Black Knight, 
which integrates this CYV gene from Great, uh, Great Northern 1140 into a popular black bean called Midnight. And again, uh, some, some studies of the mechanism of this, of, of one of these single uh, recessive genes, um, that it inhibits viral replication completely, and that another single recessive gene provided resistance to clover yellow vein virus reported by, by other coworkers. <clears throat> and then there was a, a I started working um, on, on what this, the next thing, and that was that this BC3 resistance gene um, co-segregate, resistance to another virus co-segregated with amino acid substitutions in a gene called EIF4E, and that's eukaryotic translation initiation factor 4E. The allelic relationships amongst all of these different symbols was never really resolved. <coughs> and um, this hypothesis that um, amino acid substitutions in this candidate gene um, could be involved with clover yellow vein virus resistance was also never investigated. And so I took a candidate gene approach um, asking the question is if, um, asking the question if amino acid substitutions in this very well-known virus resistance gene was responsible for clover yellow vein virus resistance in common bean. And this is an example of all of um, many of the species where this has been functionally conferred in Arabidopsis and pepper and pea and lettuce and barley and many others since then. And essentially, this translation initiation complex, if you have um, uh, subtle amino acid substitutions in, these, in this EIF4E protein, and sometimes in EIF4G and an isoform of EIF4E, essentially you get incompatible interactions between the virus and the host uh, F and, and, uh, and confers effective resistance. And so these are amino acid alignments of pepper, pea, and pepper, and, or pepper, pea, and lettuce. And you can see that the amino acid substitutions align in generally the same regions. And so I, I cloned and sequenced this gene in, in 21 informative common bean genotypes that had some of these uh, recessive resistance alleles. And sure enough, um, the wild type is at the top. And there were these patterns of amino acid substitution that corresponded directly with uh, clover yellow vein virus resistance <coughs> in these different genotypes. And what you can see from, from this table is that basically in order to have clover yellow vein virus resistance, you need to have this mutation in this position. So this is most likely the, the functional de, um, determinant for resistance to clover yellow vein virus. And then there was a set of other alleles. Um, if you have a, a mutation in this position 111, you have resistance to clover yellow vein virus, as well as um, many strains of, of many other common potiviruses that are important in common bean production. And so with this information, um, I did some allelism testing and determined that they were all, in fact, alleles at the same locus and also develop some CASP, uh, CASP assays to co uh, see if these amino acid substitutions or non-synonymous SNPs co-segregated with the resistance phenotype in a segregating population. And so I used the black knight by midnight that were already near isogenic lines and demonstrated that, um, that the SNPs based on, on the, where, we th where I thought the functional determinant was that they co-segregated perfectly with uh, the phenotype in a F2 population of 193 plants. And we don't really have a way to do functional conferral in common bean. It's very difficult to transform. There are some VIGS vectors, but um, I think the evidence with all of the other crop plants is, is quite enough. And there are numerous um, seed companies that are using the, these assays uh, as we speak. And then I just demonstrated how the, uh, how the assays could be used to, to sort of haplotype these 21 informative common bean genotypes and the relationship between the non-synonymous SNPs and their resistance phenotypes held. And I also validated this further in a collection of 54 differential dry beans and, and the, the snap beans that I found. And so um, we're really confident that we have uh, the candidate gene and the candidate mechanism for resistance to this virus. And, <clears throat> and so 
I moved on to, to, to look at bean yellow mosaic virus. Um, there are very few sources of resistance to this virus. They've never been mapped, um, never deployed, and they've been studied for, for a while, over decades in the 50s, 60s, and into the 80s. And really, there's only one allele that's been identified, and this is known as BY2. This was identified in Phaseolus coccinius, again, the scarlet runner bean, um, and was, uh, through an intraspecific cross, was integrated into snap bean by Dr. Dixon in the late 60s. Um, unfortunately, a lot of his material um, we, I either couldn't find or, or wasn't viable. And so we wound up working with uh, another uh, near isogenic line, a black bean termed B21, which is near isogenic to black turtle soup one. And this was developed by Rosie Providenti in, in coordination with Don Wallace and other bean people here at Cornell. So we wound up using um, a black bean as a donor in a, in a snap, uh, to integress into snap bean. And this is um, part of the breeding program where we made a three parent cross and then selected for snap bean plant type and pod type and for resistance. And then made another back cross to our, our recurrent parent and went through several generations of selection um, for pod and plant type and then uh, doing some testing for resistance. And I wound up with a set of recombinant inbred lines down at the bottom, um, a set of susceptible that uh, did not have BY2 and a set of resistance, resistant lines that did. And the, goal, the clear thing to do here was, well, let's genotype them and figure out you know, where the gene is. Um, so again, luckily, I almost thought about doing this with SSRs. I'm very happy to be at Cornell where genotyping by sequencing has been developed and I was uh, able to attend many of the workshops early on. <coughs> These are the phenotypes of the parents. Um, and we have a weird phenotype in here that I don't think I'll have time to talk about. Um, essentially, the gene is temperature sensitive. Um, it, it has reduced penetrance under <coughs> under low temperatures, meaning that you need high temperatures for full expression, which is really kind of weird um, amongst virus resistance genes. Um, so like I said, I, w I wanted to genotype and figure out where, these, uh, where this gene lies. And so uh, I adapted um, GBS to common bean, um, first the way that everyone else does it, just by testing the different enzymes. And <clears throat> these are the two most common that people are using, APK1 and PST1. And certainly PST1 looks like it produces a better library, but for the very narrow population and the, the narrow genetics that I wanted to genotype, I decided to use APK1 to discover potentially a higher number of SNPs that were segregating between those lines. <laughs> and the result was that I discovered and genotyped 18,000 SNPs in these um, 84, well, there, as I said, there were six susceptible rills and six resistant rills. I took seven individuals from each of those rills that made up part of the 96plex library. And this is just showing the number of SNPs um, per pseudomolecule based on, this, on the length of the pseudomolecule. And it's a pretty decent um, correlation of 0.45. <coughs> this wouldn't be the best um, sample of germplasm to test this relationship in because of the, the history of selection and the very narrow genetic base. But nonetheless, um, you know, for a couple weeks worth of work, this, uh, I don't know how long it would take to do 18,000 SSRs a lifetime. So um, the next challenge was, okay, so we have 18,000 SNPs. Uh, how, how do we figure out which ones are associated with a phenotype of interest? And that was something that I had to think about quite a bit. Um, bulk segregant analysis would, would be, you know, typically the way that major genes were, were mapped or, or at least where markers were developed for in the past, but I wasn't <coughs> very capable at, at uh, coding or, or bioinformatics, so I didn't know how to, to, to design an algorithm to associate, um, but clearly it was right in front of me, just do an association analysis. And so these are the results of, of that association analysis in the 84 snapping rills. And you can see very clearly that this allele BY2 
resides at the distal end of chromosome two. I, I discovered 44 SNPs that were very strongly associated and a nice physical interval thanks to the common bean genome of about a megabase where this gene lies. And there's numerous candidate genes in there. The problem is, is that it's a, it is a region with complex uh, disease resistance genes. So it's gonna be challenging to actually figure out where, where the actual gene is. I used GAPIT um, to do this analysis, which is an incredibly useful tool for those of you that don't know about it. Um, it's also very user friendly. Um, so I, again, I designed CAS, assay, uh, CAS SNP assays to test uh, and validate the results of the GWAS. And these assays uh, showed that <coughs> uh, I was able to, de to design at least three of them that segregated completely with the phenotype in, in all cases. And so <coughs> these are tightly linked markers that we can now use to, uh, in, in the breeding program. So to summarize uh, the research that I did, I, <coughs> I, I assembled a collection of, of 380 snap bean cultivars and, and looked at how uh, these, diff these three important viruses um, looked at the, at the patterns of symptom expression uh, th that are caused by these three important viruses. I developed field-based evaluation methodology to examine the correlation between symptom severity and yield to estimate the potential impact of the viruses. I resolved allelic relationships and identified a, a putative molecular basis for resistance to clover yellow vein virus and developed markers to select for it in the future. And then I adapted GBS to common bean to <coughs> and demonstrated a novel way to map a major gene in, in the context of a breeding program. And we're using that at present. And the 380 snap beans <coughs> is really a platform for trait mapping and allele discovery and snapping going forward. So going forward, some of the future research would be to fine map and clone BY2, um, investigate the, the dosage and temperature effects when BY2 is present. Um, we should also investigate the role of these uh, BC3 alleles in the accumulation and movement as it seems like they have a role in other viruses, which is common in virus common bean interactions. We'd like to pyramid these two alleles um, for durability's sake. Um, as far as cucumber mosaic virus resistant goes, we need to dissect the symptom severity uh, phenotypes a bit better, as in understand the inheritance, um, look at virus accumulation and movement throughout the plants over the course of their development. Um, it would be important to elucidate the molecular genetics of additional virus resistance alleles in common bean, again, because of the wide resistance spectrum that many of these alleles have in common bean. There are 5,000 uh, bean tilling lines, which could be a potentially useful resource given the very simple nature of virus resistance. We could discover new virus alleles in these tilling lines. And then I would be excited to genotype the 380 snap beans, really examine the genetic diversity of snap bean, <coughs> the population structure, and, and conduct additional GWAS for important traits. <coughs> and so, um, we already really have the phenotypes for these, these virus resistance responses for this 380 panel. Um, there are other viruses where we could identify other resistance genes very quickly. There are viruses that are important in seed production um, that we could also screen for major genes very quickly. Uh, and there are also some very interesting traits in common bean that, that are, have uh, small numbers of large effect QTL, like uh, initial root system morphology or resistance to fungal and bacterial diseases that could also be um, mapped and identified in a panel like this relatively quickly and efficiently. And so <coughs> we, I was lucky enough, we work together with Seneca Foods and we had this panel increase this past summer in uh, Eastern Washington. And I was fortunate enough to go out there and, and verify that all the tags match the phenotypes. And so it, moving forward, it really is, I, I hope, to be a resource for SNAP bean improvement. With that, I would like to thank uh, Griff for giving me the opportunity to study in his lab. Um, all of the members of, of his program who have worked extremely hard and diligently with my materials, Matt, 
Sarah, Jeff, Kevin, uh, Charles, a previous um, student, and many summer assistants. Uh, my committee members, Mark Fuchs, Steve Reiners, and Dave Wolf, I'd like to thank them for their support and their criticism. And then a number of colleagues and professors that played uh, really important roles in, in my research and my sanity. Um, Jason Cavatorta, Judd Ward, John Gotchula, Fred Gooker and Larry Smart, Paola Barba, um, Alex Lipka, Michael Mazurik, Michael Gore, Kelly Swartz, and Lisa and Charlotte for their help with, uh, with genotyping by sequencing. So with that, I'd like to conclude. <laughs>